Then, warmed up, he had started taxiing across the sand, his long mountain legs casting wild shadows from the moon. He aimed for the eastern fence and planned to take off and soar above the spiked wire in a gesture of derision. But halfway down the road he slowed down suddenly and crouched. By shadowy sound, his spirit-sensitive ears detected another traveler, and he whirled and flattened against a barracks building. From a door of the officer's quarters, a short and heavy form came striding and paused in the open moonlight. Major Lewis hesitated, reconnoitered, and seeing only the dry, unspeaking sand, the bright, expressionless autumn moon seemed satisfied. Over his face came a silly, expectant look, and his mouth opened and shut like a toad devouring flies. After a few minutes, Joe realized the major was singing as he flailed his arms and waved, and as he flailed his arms and warmed up for the flight. From the desert I come to thee, he was singing on a stallion shod with fire. Oh my God! Muttered Joe. Muttered, Oh my God! Then the major was running, beating his arms in perfect form and heading for the gate with terrific speed. Breathless, Joe watched him and saw him suddenly leap, click his heels together, and soar upward with a roar like a little four-engine bomber. The perfect takeoff of long practice. Joe sighed with envy and slid out from the shadow. Bastard, he murmured. Bastard! Then his eyes filled with a deep and cynical scorn. The Major had shot like a bullet westward and not toward the high towers of Manhattan which seemed an odd thing for a man whose wife never went further westward. Went farther westward the Hot Springs, Virginia. From the desert I come to thee, Joe whinnied derisively, on a stallion shot with fire. He stamped his big feet in the sand. Did I speak to you? he muttered fiercely. Wait till you're spoken to, soldier. A flame of intolerable hate flared up in him, and then he remembered it was growing late, and started to run, forgetting the Major, and concentrating with all his might, and Polichick's lesson, and his warning. Flail those arms, pick up the feet, and then jump, so, leap, beat, beat, right, left, together, beat. He felt himself soaring upward, in a wild rush, clearing the barrack fence, and heading like a comet for the sky. Watch you level off! Polichick had warned him. Once I forgot, my God, the stars! He had leveled off, and then... He had leveled off then, and flown eastward in the moonlight. Brownsville, Indiana, here I come. Below him, the dry autumn fields of Colorado, the bony creek beds twisting whitely, the forms of sleeping cattle soaked in moonlight. The cold, pure air whistled by his ears. It was an extraordinary and exhilarating experience. He felt as though he had been doing it all his life, and he wanted to try a nosedive just for the hell of it. Joseph was too cautious. Keep level, he'd say. Don't fuss around. You've, you've got to go fast. But Indiana wasn't. But Indiana wasn't Europe. And Joe turned down his right hand, raised his left, and bore down with a mighty rush. The cattle lifted up stricken faces and poured over the pastures, their wet hooves glittering. Joe grinned and swept on eastward. Above the Solomon River he hit, an, he hit an air pocket and dropped downward with a sickening rush, but recovered himself and pulled up again, beating his way above the cold, scaly water, the river smell chilling his throat. Somehow he thought he saw other forms, far off, dim wing shapes of soldiers passing, but was not sure, not till he pulled past the Pika, lights burning like a handful of embers on a plain, did he meet another nocturnal flyer close enough to speak. Here he was overtaken by a young Negro sergeant bound for Carolina and traveling fast. Joe acknowledged his coming with a right arm sweep and motioned as though to shake his hand. Cold, sergeant? Cold? Been at this flying long? Learned last week. Been home every night since. He laughed as if something... He laughed as if it's... He laughed as at something secret and very pleasant. First flight for me, Joe said. I don't know how it'll be, not sure of all the rules. The sergeant laughed. Me neither, he winged in closer. You learn something new every time. Last night I landed late and I walked up the backyard after my wife was asleep. She can't see you till she sleeps. And the lights were all out, only a bright moon so you could see everything white. And the moonflowers hanging on the fence 
Well, I walk up and past that old broken swing the kids still use, and suddenly I stop. I'm not kidding you. I stopped like a man shot dead, and there, sitting down on the swing, scuffing his boots and looking all out of joints, was the mortal soul of my first lieutenant. He laughed out loudly, and after a moment of uncertainty, Joe laughed too. He couldn't get in, the sergeant gloated. That's one of the things you learned. She never thought about him. She didn't know he was there. Joe took an, exuding leap, an exulting leap. What'd you do? The sergeant shrugged. Just let him swing. A man's got a right to dream, I guess. He was gone when I came out again. Only a scuff place under the swing, he laughed again. They flew on for a minute in silence, and then they saw the lights of St. Louis and the sluggish silvery mud of the Mississippi. Here's where I leave you, brother, the sergeant said. Take it slow and easy. Don't eat, don't drink, and a long night to you. He was gone, winging darkly southward, and soon lost in the shadows. Not long now for Joe. Fly east, young man, familiar hills and farmlands going under, but he could not see them well in the night. I was afraid, he told Charlotte. I thought I'd pass over and land in Brooklyn. You'll know, Joseph kept telling me, but I got the jitters. No map, no compass. How'd I know Brownsville from Ashtabula? How did you know, Charlotte whispered. He held her and laughed. There had been no question about his finding her. He had flown lower and lower, peering at highways and little billboards, and the silent impassive roofs of towns. Suddenly he realized that he was gliding slowly downward, as in the grip of a thick, receding tide. I just knew, he said. Now crossing the Kansas border and beating on, he knew he would find the camp all right, not by any love gravity of the heart, but because it was so damn big that he could not miss it. He felt calm and happy. Tomorrow was tomorrow, and the hell with yesterday. He saw the white, shining, snow-cold peaks, and the canyon towns, and then the camp stretched out far below him. There wasn't much time, but he circled slowly above it, hunting hawk-like for signs of some living thing on the outskirts of the plain. Then he saw what he was seeking. A mile westward from the camp, a small fat form, like a two-legged dusty beetle scurrying across the sand. Leisurely, heartlessly, like a falcon over a wounded hare, Joe circled nearer and lower. He knew the Major's old hummocky run, he ate too much, and he drank too much, and a lot of other things too much, and he foundered all, all night, he thought. On the wings of the desert I come to thee, Joe sang in a low, sweet voice. He swooped low, and the wind of his swooping swept the Major's hat from his round, blonde head. It gleamed like a moonflower opening wide in the pale, gray desert air. Get a horse, bud, Joe shouted coarsely. Get a horse! Then happily, Joe soared, up, soared upward, with firm, triumphant strokes, and plummeted swiftly toward the barracks, taking care to avoid the soul of Joseph, returning in haste from Europe, the dawn like a white Gestapo at his heels. And that is the end of that story.